Good afternoon. I'm Ann Mutchler. I'm with Semiconductor Engineering, and thank you all for coming to the panel today. Um, we are focusing on women in technology, and we, I want to, I hope that this panel gives female engineers some encouragement, because there's a lot of maybe not so direct advice today, and so I really hope that this is inspiring and um, just, uh, you know, encouraging. So I wanted to, I've been looking for research on diversity and what I found is that according to the Harvard Business Review, striving to increase workplace diversity is not an empty slogan it's actually a good business decision, which to me, that would mean we would have a lot more diversity in our industry, especially. According to a 2015 McKinsey report on 366 public companies, it found that those in the top quadrille for, for ethnic and racial diversity in management were 35% more likely to have financial returns above their industry mean. So there's actually financial benefits to a more diverse employee roster. Um, and those companies in the top quadrille um, for gender diversity were 15% more likely to have returns above the industry mean. So, I mean, the facts kind of speak for themselves. There's actual factual proof that a more gender diverse staff is of financial benefit. In a, and also, in a global analysis of 2,400 companies conducted by Credit Suisse, organizations with at least one female board member yielded higher a higher return on equity and higher net income growth than those that did not have any women on the board. So no matter what research we look at, non-homogenous employee uh, you know, staffs are simply a smarter way to go. So that said, um, today though we really want to focus on what it is that we can change, how do we change it, and kind of the direction forward. And I also would like to open it up to everyone in the audience. When you have a question, please come to the mic and we will field the questions because I'd really like this to be interactive. So to start off, each of the panelists will introduce themselves and give a little bit of perspective on their career, and then we will jump into some questions. So, that said, Radhika, would you like to start? Sure. Thank you, thank you, Anne. Thank you all so much for coming here and uh, spending time with us and uh, hearing from all of us. So my name is Radhika Shankar, and um, I am a group director at uh, Synopsys. Been with Synopsys for 20 years now, just celebrated my 20th anniversary with Synopsys. Um, it has been a fantastic uh, career, definitely lots of ups and downs, uh, balancing the workforce as well as uh, personal uh, responsibilities. So for me, um, I grew up in um, uh, India in a, a town called Chennai. I uh, graduated uh, from Gindi Engineering College uh, with a bachelor's in engineering. And um, I'm proud to say that um, you know, I have three older brothers, and uh, none of them went into engineering. They all went into uh, finance and accounting, and I paved my own path. Um, and uh, growing up, um, I was uh, actually also into, uh, heavily into classical Indian dancing, so I balanced um, my engineering uh, studies as well as uh, my passion for arts. 
But what worked um, for me early on in my career, um, I see a lot of uh, uh, people here who are interns and who are new college grads. If uh, you find a company uh, that is uh, technologically very superior, uh, passionate people and um, you know, great leaders, very open culture and very diverse set of people, and if you have that, that this company is the right fit for me, stay. I know that people say that if you move uh, around a lot, you can advance. But in my uh, career, uh, staying in Synopsys as a senior one engineer to senior two to the management ladder uh, to management and then into uh, as a director and now leading an organization, it has been very, very good. So if you find that passionate company, stay. So that worked. What uh, could have been better? So. I feel that you know, very early on in your career, as soon as you graduate and then um, you're starting a career, you have all these um, aspirations you know, by um, what is my midterm, what is my long-term goal? This is where I want to be. So you have all that vision. But five to 10 years um, down your career, what happens is your personal and family responsibilities also increase, right? But you are still continuing your work with passion. So please don't doubt yourself. You know, if I have to run and pick up my child from daycare at five, that does not mean you're any less than anyone who's working beyond that time. So speak for yourself. And uh, if there are opportunities and promotions uh, that are coming, sp speak up, right? You're doing the work. So make sure that you do it, especially in those five to 10 years onwards. And what could have been uh, better and what are the things that uh, I wish um, I, I, can, I could have done. And uh, my advice to you all is early on, uh, you know, just like we do a SWOT analysis of our products, uh, do a SWOT analysis about yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are the opportunities? What are the threats? So be confident about your strengths. Sometimes, you know, when we are getting these 350, 360 degree feedback, what we uh, do is, you know, these are the strengths, and then you want to see, okay, what are my weaknesses? But focus on the strength because capitalize on your strength, right? If, if you're a people person, if you are very good in leading teams, if you are very passionate about a technology, use those strengths. And of course, focus on the weaknesses, improve on it, take classes in finance and business. Te you know, all the technical deep dive we automatically do in our company, but take the time to look into business aspect of things. Why am I doing what I'm doing? So think about that. So those are some of my thoughts. Uh, I don't know whether I did okay with the time, but uh, uh, that's a start. That's great, thank you so much. Gita, thank you. Sure, great start, Radhika. So Gita Pines, first of all, good afternoon, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming and talk, you know, listening. Please ask questions like what you have on your mind, as Anne said. So Gita Pine, I am the chief architect for enterprise architecture at Intuit, which is a company that we make, you know, technology company. We make software for consumer and small businesses to help them manage their finances. So our mission is like powering prosperity around the world. So how do you, you know, make ends meet? and that's what we focus on. So every day I wake up with a mission. So that brings me to when I started. So I grew up like Radhika in India. I'm from eastern part of India called Calcutta. And I am by education, I'm a computer science engineer. And my first job was I started on a very prestigious institute in India, Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO. For those who may not know, it's kind of like the NASA for India. And what a great day to be talking about space when we are getting the images from James Webb today from billions of years ago. So I started my chapter, and I think early in the career, I would say it is very important to start at a place where you know you learn and it lays out your foundation. I think I learned my like you know basic like the first principles, right? Everything you can break it down into bite-sized chunks. No matter I started with working on satellite data, image processing, and we did not have the cloud compute at our disposal. I am old, like 25 years back, right? So we had to. So what did I learn? And my first job 
there is no shortcut to hard work, as we all know, like you know, learning and education. If you put your mind into it and believe in yourself, and as Radhika said, be confident, stick to it, persevere, you will make, be coming to the solution, right? So, and, and when you work, when you work with you know, people that are, surra you are surrounded by smart people, knowledge makes you humble. I'm really, really fortunate that I started with people that were way smarter than me and also knew a lot more than I did. And uh, in uh, addition to that, having an environment, when we, what we call today like you know, fail-safe environment, that it is okay to fail, it is okay to express your opinion I think that's the environment, again, I was very fortunate because I was in a research and development institute of Indian Space Research Organization, so I could, and because I knew nothing, I could ask, I could challenge assumptions, so, and that's how I became better, uh, that's how I became better in you know, asking right questions, think like a scientist, challenging every assumption, and you know, experiment and fail fast. The things that I would say, um, you know, as I, as I talked about, like, you know, working on image processing parallel, you know, back in the days, I was also very fortunate because we didn't have these disposable cloud technologies. I was one of the very first engineers that worked on India's first parallel, indigenous parallel computer called Param because you were dealing with volume of data, you're dealing with volume of computation, you're trying to do signal processing and, para, you know, pattern de detection. And how do you do that? So we, I worked on parallel computer, and I also learned the value of resources, how you have to be sensitive to the, everything you do, whether it is a computation, whether it is a storage, whether it is the communication you are doing, or your noisy neighbor problem. Very early stage, I think the foundation that laid, I know I, I was very fortunate to learn, I still apply that every day. One thing I do feel like could have been like, you know, really, it worked is that your perseverance and hunger and curiosity always works. It would have been nice to know having, uh, you know, it is okay to fail in a way that decisions and outcomes are different. Like you can have a very good decision framework. Make the most important, like the decision with the facts that you know. We all focus on outcomes, but at the same time, give yourself a little bit of slack if you are not able to meet the outcomes because there are variables that you cannot control. So very early stage, you know, we are all very hard, right? We, we are high performers, we expect a lot, but I think I learned later in my stage, I should have given myself some slack. It is okay not to always outperform. It is okay not to be the topper in everything, right? And at that time, I think tender age, having a mentor, and not only just a mentor in the later stage, after 10 years or 15 years, you'll know that you need a sponsor who's going to be there for you, who's going to be championing out there for you. I think those things, I think, would have really helped me. And the last but not the least, I would say, it is a team. You cannot alone do everything, so rely on others. Rely on your coworkers, rely on your managers. And it is okay to say that you do not know. Asking for, like, I don't know. Asking for clarification, it is 100% okay. So with that, you know, I'll pass it on to Sherry. Thank you so much. Sherry. Okay, excellent, so you can hear me. Uh, my name is Sherry Hess and I'm with Cadence Design Systems. I'm a senior product uh, marketing manager of what we call our systems analysis technology. So in this space, if you're uh, doing chip design, package design, or complete system design, there's uh, multi-physics issues that pop up, whether that's electromagnetic, thermal, RF, uh, signal integrity, power integrity. These are the products that I'm responsible for within Cadence. Now, I'm going to be a contrarian to our first speaker a little bit in that I started my career, I, I went to Carnegie Mellon University with uh, BSW and was recruited by Intel and spent uh, three years at Intel, a great place to learn, right? You come out of school not necessarily knowing how to apply your knowledge. Intel was uh, sensational in giving me exposure to things. They definitely had um, safety nets out there on mentors and advisors, and I look back and I'm like, I didn't even realize that's what it was, right? You're just kind of blind going into that first job, or at least I was. And then, because I'm a, I don't know, a, a adrenaline junkie, I went to a startup. 
So, I mean, Intel, I, I look back, people that I still know at Intel, oh my God, they've already retired. Um, but I went to a startup and I have stayed at a startup majority of my career and I actually came to Cadence two and a half years ago via a spin out of a, of a startup, right? And I have to say Cadence in a way is a startup for my products because they're newer products in the market so it fits my personality perfectly. Um, but uh, let me answer, I want to flip to if I'm talking to myself like 20, 30 years ago now, what sort of advice would I give? And I actually made a little cheat sheet here. Um, so. When I went to the startup, I was the only female, right? And I didn't think of it that way, right? Because I was just in love with what it was going to do and the opportunities and the problems we could solve, right? That feeds kind of the inner engineer that we all have. But looking back, I would say, think about a relationship map, developing your network, right? Whether it's male or female, higher level people in the organization, uh, I was at the lowest level, so there wasn't anybody lower, but peers and colleagues, but you can also go to customers, right, and partners, and I think it's very important to develop this network because you can learn from them, right? They can also be your uh, champion, right, say you can do it, go for it, right? They can coach you, they can mentor you, whether it's a short-term question you might have or a long-term, so that kind of relationship map and building your network of people that really will support you. Um, I'm also quite involved in IEEE, congratulations on your fellow, um, women in microwave. And, and one of the things that we talk a lot about there is having male allies. So I don't know how many men are out there, but kudos to you. Um, because oftentimes when we're the only person in the room, we can be overlooked or not asked to speak up. And so if you have a male champion in the room, they might be like, hey, Sherry. I've, you have something to say about that. They can really pull you into the conversation. So invest in those relationships where people are really your allies. Make it diverse, right? Male, female, culturally, geographically, however you define diversity, you should have your network also be a diverse network. So that, that was one of mine. Um, and, and you touched on that as well, right? And then the second one I would say is combination of what we heard earlier, you have to really believe in yourself. We all have heard of um, imposter syndrome. It's, it's real, but you just got to get that little inner voice. And, and a lady who I met recently, we asked her like, okay, she just won an award. We're like, well, what do you do to go over imposter syndrome? She's like, okay, here's what I do. I tell myself, no matter what happens, my mom loves me, <laughs> right? Which is fantastic. It's like, and I'm like, the best thing I learned there, but you know, you got to find whatever that, um, Expression is it's going to calm your voice. Believe in yourself. Be your true person, right? Um, and then I guess the third thing I would say is, similar to what you are saying, be a life learner. Don't be afraid to keep learning new things and pushing the envelope, asking questions, right? That wonderment. That's why we're all engineers. How do things work when we want to learn? So those would be my three kind of relationship. Be purposeful with that network and mentoring ship believe in yourself, figure out how to overcome that, um, that, that inner voice that sometimes says, no, you're not good enough or whatever it might be. We got to shut that up. And then also be a life learner. Keep, keep stretching and growing and learning. Those are the three I'd give to myself uh, some years ago now. Thank you, Sherry. Susanna. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Sherry. So I'm, first of all, thank you for coming. Do ask us questions, particularly the tricky ones. So I like those best. And for the male allies in the audience, please ask questions too. You know, this isn't a, a separation into two worlds. That's what happens so often at these events. Anyway, I'm going to go a different route. I'm going to tell you my story. I'm just going to try and stay away from giving you advice, although I probably can't stop myself. So by background, I'm a mathematician. In fact, I've got a PhD in something called pure maths, which is the particularly useless part of maths. <laughs> and when it's useful, it's almost by accident which means I never had any dealings with numbers, or at least no further than, say, nine. Lots of letters, A's and B's and X's and Y's. I even had to learn the Greek alphabet, because I ran out of symbols. And you know, now we all know the Greek alphabet, up to Omicron at least, but I knew it back then. And when I got my job after my studies, I thought I'd landed the dream job, right? It was a startup. There were about 10 of us when I joined, 50 or so when we got acquired. And everyone had a PhD in maths or in physics or something similar. So I was like, these are my people. This is my world. They're all like me. Except they weren't, right? They were all men. But like you, I didn't even notice that. It was sort of, actually, to my embarrassment, there was a sense of pride 
that I can keep up with the guys. I mean, seriously, is that something to be proud of? But I was back then. And uh, yeah, okay, now, I'm admit now I've come out to all of you about this. <laughs> so anyway, I yeah, did a good job. I enjoyed it. I was f felt proud of what I was doing. Also, I suffered from the same things that we ascribe to women. So I only spoke up when I was like 100% sure I was right. I never asked for anything, not for projects, not for promotions, not for anything. Oh, and I wanted everyone to be happy too. And, you know, other stuff like that that is generally not career enhancing. And, and I want to be super clear that none of the men were... Well, okay, let me reword that. Most of the time, people weren't holding, deliberately holding me back or being mean or anything like that. But they weren't supporting me either. I mean, the term allies in that sense hadn't really been coined. And in any case, we were all geeks. They probably wouldn't have known how to do it, even if they could. So what happened over the years? You know, I got promoted, did good work, got recognition. But it was also as if a part of me wasn't expressing itself. And in fact, as I was looking back on the lockdowns during the pandemic, that was kind of similar. You know, in the lockdown, we all did great job, great, great work from home. Everything went well, but something didn't, was locked away. I'm meeting other people specifically. And... I mean, during the lockdown, at least I knew what it was. But back then, I didn't know what it was. I just knew there was something inside me that, that didn't come out and that had no place, and I couldn't access it and no one else could. So I took up competitive sport in my spare time. And that is obviously not going to work for everyone, but for me, that was sort of the, the rescue, if you like, because I found my competitive spirit, I found my ambition, I found my confidence, I had another world out there, and then I managed to take that confidence back into the workplace. And by that stage, we'd been acquired, so I actually had access to a huge network, but without the confidence, that wasn't doing anything for me, because even when people reached out to me, I didn't really know what to do, and I certainly wasn't reaching out to other people. But this boost that I'd given myself, kind of by accident, it's not like I'd planned it, that really helped me. And then a few years ago, I this was all back in the UK, I relocated to the US, and that's where my career really took off, and I got all these opportunities that I wouldn't otherwise have had, but I didn't get them because the US is better than the UK. I mean, obviously, the US is better than the UK, but that wasn't the reason. I got them because I was ready to embrace them, and I got them because I was also willing to put myself forward and to believe in my ideas so that other people then also believed in them, and that's what really made the difference to me. So... I too am old, so it's a long time ago, and back then we didn't even know what diversity meant. And that's changed now. I think theoretically at least we all understand, I think I'm coming to the advice bit here. So theoretically we all understand that diversity is important. What the next step is for us is to make this theoretical concept into something real. And that's something that I hope we can talk about here and have some ideas on. Thank you. Perfect. Well, and that is really, that's the question. We, we, we have identified it very clearly, what diversity is. The numbers show that companies benefit, even financially, from diversity. So what is it that is going to really change things? So I'm going to start. Are we going in the... Oh. Let's go in reverse order. I, so I used to hate quotas, so this proportion of women. And I think everyone who's part of an underrepresented minority hates them because then they feel they didn't get... I mean, I've, people still to this day say to me, you've only got this position because you're a woman. So it's, it's not great. You wouldn't th you'd think we'd be over that. But I also am coming around to the idea that this isn't just about me. I hate it for myself but I don't hate it for society. So anything that we can do to push this a little bit forward, right now, I regret to say it, but I think it is needed. I wish we didn't need it, but I, I do think we have Specifically to. Specifically, what is needed? Just the monitoring. So okay. coming back to my days in the UK in Cambridge, we hired in our own image, and we were proud of it. I was proud of it. I never hired a single woman back then. I only hired men because... Hey, everyone around me looked like that, and I hired someone who looked like that, who talked like that, who came from the same universities, who had the same background. 
with pride. I mean, I cannot emphasize this enough. I just didn't know better. And now I've been doing this for a long time. So to not do that, I've got to force my, I'm breaking a habit here. And that's not going to happen naturally. Good. Thank you. Very nice. So I would add to that that I think just the fact that we're having this discussion today and the awareness is really the first step and we're okay to talk about it, right? Because we weren't even aware of it, the unconscious bias that was taking place. And, and I'm asked to make coffee all the time when I'm in a room with a bunch of men because they just assume that that's, that's my role there. And, you, and I laugh at, you know, I make a joke. I'm like, well, you can make it with me too, I guess the coffee or something like that. But being aware, right? That is the first step. And um, then to your point about quotas, I mean, California has put the size of your company, you have to have, you know, a certain number of female board members. So there is a little bit of a quota taking place there. I think that is a very positive change. And uh, also IEEE has put out what they call Women in Engineering Pledge, where they're asking all the societies to be aware that if you're having a conference like this, you're having a panel or keynote presentation, that we should make sure it's with an eye to diversity whatever or however we might define that. So again, I think it all starts with that awareness. Maybe a little bit of quotas at the highest level will also be the, uh, the role model, right, to, to lead the way. And, and then I think it's the willingness in large companies like Cadence, Synopsys, the companies we all represent here, where it comes down from the top that we do believe um, it's in our financial best interest to be a diverse company. And, and we just put it into practice, however, uh, that takes shape, but I, I'm a big believer on awareness and we start discussing it, change will follow. Yeah. Tagging on that, Sherry, is 100%. First is awareness and then it comes. But I do also have a little allergic reaction to, you know, numbers and met because metrics can be always gamed, right? So, but I think it is the intention. We all have a role to play. It is good to have the corporate mandate from the top, but they should be at the ground. Each of us, starting with, we, we all have a responsibility to do something about it, right? So whether you're taking, like I'm just hiring a product manager, so am I internally, am I getting the best candidate internally or externally? Is it a female or a male? And I think diversity is not just about female, right? It is about the mindset. It is about the different background and perspectives. Why we need different things, right? Because collectively we become a better. Our team is never composed of the similar homogeneous. If we are all female engineers here, is it the best team? I am not sure, right? I mean, it is good. We have all representations, but you need a different mindset. We don't need me to in everything like same. I, I, I think diversity is an ingredient of, but but it has to be, I believe it has to be on the ground, like whether you are the engineers you know, locally in across the globe, like whether wherever your offices are, it cannot be centrally as a program executed. Then it becomes a number game. We look good on a statistics, but we never empower. It is about empowering people on the ground is what I believe in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, true, Gita. Absolutely second that. So don't think it's someone else's responsibility. Each and every one of us, whether you're a leader or a newcomer, and whether you are a female or a male, take that, that it is important. Also, when you have an uh, interview panel, make sure it's a diverse set of interview panels. That's extremely important. With that itself, you can judge whether this company is the right fit for you. If it's all going to be uh, one gender or the other, then you know, make sure that you know diverse set of interview panel is also there. So I think it, it's everyone's responsibility. Perfect, thank you. We have lots of questions. Oh, wow. okay. Please, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, and I'm gonna open up with something that is very dear to my heart, and that is, how do we engage uh, young women from the very early age to believe, first and foremost, they can do math, and second of all, that engineering or sciences are for them? Because culturally, that has been an issue and um, with uh, National Engineers Week and Discover Engineering and, and even uh, women in engineer groups that I've been a part, um, we've gone out to schools and tried to encourage kids to think differently about their options and their future. And I just wondered if you have any comments on that. I can 
think, uh, I, I think uh, again, my answer might be a little different. I said, you know, let's stop, I think, thinking about that because it is a girl and because, because or it is a boy, that's why it should be different. I think everybody should be exposed to the same disciplines. We all have this kind of similar level of brain that we are born with, right? So I think that very first bias that we start thinking about it, I think that, hey, uh, should it be going for STEM or not? I think that itself starts to you know, plant a doubt in the mind that, am I good enough? Is this something I should be? I think everybody should be exposed. All little girls and boys should be exposed equally. And then encourage them if they're struggling. Like, you know, what can we do to help them learn the art or craft of, say, maths and science and finding ways to you know, help them? But throw them in the you know, way, path of opportunities I'm sure that's the first step for me. It is like throw them. Like do not even hesitate and do not even distinguish that it's a girl or a boy. Great. <laughs> um, real quick, I, let's get to some more. You have a quick comment? I was just going to do a quick comment. That's a great question that we're often asked on behalf of women in engineering. It, it's not an easy one to solve. But I would just add that having female role models be present, that other women, young women, can see and go like, oh, I could be like that, that's very important as well. We need to be seen and appreciated for the Perfect. younger generation to be inspired. Please go ahead. Uh, so Lala Besha at the University of Calgary. Um, can you hear me? Okay, uh, so my question is, it's really good to increase diversity, put quota, bring in more uh, young females to engineering, but unless we change the systems we have, they don't be included. And that could be things like maternity leave, flexible hours, hours that actually matches the life we have, and so on. So what are your companies as leaders in industry doing to actually set the stage for having uh, the workforce that's diverse included in their... Uh, so let me take the opportunity not to talk about my company, but about how something good might have come out of the pandemic here. Because I think everyone working from home and everyone being exposed to their families has given us all much more awareness of the family responsibilities. And it's also become socially much more acceptable for men to be doing that. And previously, that was kind of tucked away when men did deal with childcare. It wasn't as sort of obvious, and for women, you, know, you got asked, how are your kids, whatever, those kind of questions that we didn't ask men. And I think COVID has opened our minds a little bit there because everyone was at home all the time. So something, sometimes the right thing happens naturally, if we can call COVID natural. So I think that's, that makes me glad. One thing I want to you asked about companies, what they are doing. So in addition to you know, maternity leave and all that, let's say somebody has taken some time off and they want to come back. So we have um, you know, what is called a returnship opportunity. So this is no matter what the circumstances were, whether it's for taking care of a young child or a parent, if you have been out of workforce for two years or more, a, a Synopsys has a program called Returnship where we are encouraging people to come back. Um, we mentor them, train them, uh, give them the right tools and the uh, people to help them ramp up. And then once they're ready for it, it turns into a full-time opportunity. So something that we are doing. Great. Please go ahead. Um, thank you to all the panelists for sharing the experience and wisdom with us. Uh, my name is Nimisha. I just joined Synopsys. I actually graduated recently with PhD in electrical engineering, and Synopsys is my first industry job. So my question to all the panelists is, how exactly do you identify a mentor? How do you identify a mentor? A mentor. So I would just ask uh, you to clarify that, like to even get started, do we have a mentor? Or when you have a roster of mentors, how you would pick from that? Or you're going to say both? Both. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> um, the larger companies. Like a checklist for mentors. OK. The larger companies, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here, uh, likely have a mentoring um, organization within the company. And one thing that, that Cadence has done that was new to me, it's called an onboarding buddy. I don't know if any of you have that. So as, as soon as you join, they kind of peer, uh, give you somebody to partner with to help you in a way mentor and, and come up that learning curve. And I think every six months we have a mentoring cycle and you can submit to have a mentor and put the goal out there and they do matching. And I know Intel and Corvo and a lot of other companies uh, do a similar thing. 
and I'm like an infomercial for IEEE, but in IEEE as well, there also are mentoring opportunities if you'd like to make a network outside of your own company. Yeah. I, w I would like to add to that. We have a program too that assigns mentors to mentees. But I would strongly encourage you to go outside of that. Also, consider a mentor that isn't too close to what you're doing anyway. You'll learn that anyway. You've got people around you. So if you're in engineering, look for someone in marketing. That gives a different angle right from the start. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Synopsis. And uh, <laughs> so uh, definitely, we do have a program, mentor-mentee program. There is a platform. We can introduce you to all of that. Uh, that's a good start and then you know, onboarding buddy and I also absolutely agree that you know within your company um, also choose someone that is uh, orthogonal uh, to what you're doing that way you get a different perspective that can guide you as well but we can connect up and I can give you more information. I I'm going to just add too that I often thought a mentor was somebody that would be with you for life and you can have a very short-term goal and be mentored and you could have somebody more like a career coach as well, and so it kind of ebbs and flows, the whole mentor-mentee relationship. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Shruti. I'm from University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm doing my PhD. Uh, I have three things to say, two questions in one um, remark or something, I don't know. Um, to Su uh, Susanna, is that, uh, and am, I, am I saying it right? Okay. Um, I was really impressed when you said that uh, there were certain things that you knew, but then there are certain things that you're changing right now after getting to know better. It was something I, I really liked it, so that's one. Um, my first question is, uh, being in the industry that you guys have come to the current position that you have, uh, very respected companies, I'm sure you guys have dealt with a lot of sexism and, you know, colorism, racism and every other kind of ism there is. Um, given that you have dealt with it, how is it that you've stuck to the career path that you have stuck to and come to this stage and not, um, you know, gotten to a position where you're like, okay, this shit is everywhere and I need to change my career path to get into politics or something to change it. And, and um, yeah, that's my question, first one. Let me start, and I'm not proud of this either. This is like this big disclosure session here. I often ignored it because I couldn't deal with it. So the little things like call a taxi because you're the only woman in the room. I've been asked where the male restrooms are when I'm the only, I mean, for goodness sake, how hard can that be? But I've kind of absorbed it and swallowed it and post-processed it much later. So this is not a recommendation. This is more, don't do it that way. Hmm. I wish I hadn't done it that way, but that was what I needed at the time. Got I think it. now it's really, find someone to talk to about it. I don't think it's always the smartest move to make a big stink, but that's my personal choice. And other people have other choices. You know, that's, everyone has to decide that for themselves. But bottling it up like I did, don't do it. It's not good for you. <laughs> I'll go quickly add, like I think very similar, but I mean, own the room when you come in and don't let anybody make assumptions about you because you look tiny or because you have an accent or whatever you look like people used to think of me. Do I bring coffee or do I do? So just take the seat and declare who you are, why you have a seat at the table. I think taking that position and uh, you can always, you know, complain, think about it. Those things can go. But if the company culture doesn't allow you, then it is obviously not the company you want to stick around. But take ownership, declare who you are and why you have a seat at the table. Yeah. Uh, let me just add a little bit to that as well. Um, so I think whether it's male, female, whatever, you're always going to run into people with different personalities that you're going to have to uh, deal with in your career. And um, part of the reason I think we're all engineers or mathematicians up here is because we love solving problems. So I approach it as, well, that's an interesting problem of human engineering. How are we going to solve that? So I kind of turn it around into an opportunity to learn about myself or maybe how to find a creative work around. Uh, one more thing, um, you know, I mean, I, I told you I grew up with three brothers. So since young, I have been completely bullied. I'm really ready for this, right? <laughs> but at the same time, um, you know, one thing is be authentic and true to yourself. Just because someone else is saying something else, uh, don't stoop to that level. You be who you are and stick to your ground and stay um, true to yourself, I think things will fall in place. And one thing that I do in a room, uh, you know, um, first thing I do in a chair is pull it up. This I couldn't do, so I'm like, like that, so that I'm like yeah. tall. And you know, as Geeta said, own it and then stay true to yourself. It will automatically come out. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, this might be asking for too much, but can you give me an example of these kind of situations that you dealt with without giving me any specific um, uh, names and how you dealt with that situation, like in your career path or wherever? Because I, I sometimes I'm like stuck in a certain situation and I would really like it if I get like, you know, a mentor and learning to see how you guys think in a situation and how you deal with it. It'll be easier for me to analyze a situation that I might go through it as well. Um, so if you can be a little more specific and give me like an instance of a situation that you've dealt with and how you dealt with, uh, that'll be really good. Are we at this therapy session now? <laughs> Is this where we're going? Very, very personal information. <laughs> but um, I, I was young and uh, given the opportunity by a male ally, actually, who saw me as capable, where other people were like, oh, we never even thought to ask Sherry to move to Europe and start a European division of a startup, right? Other men were asked and they declined and then a, a male ally's like, Sherry, don't you wanna do that? I'm like, of course. And everybody else just thought, well, we didn't think because you were female and you know, whatever. And uh, so I went and uh, we acquired a company and one of the gentlemen at the company started to refer to me as the little girl in charge. I told you this is therapy, I'm being brutally <laughs> honest. And um, the team that I assembled, it's very much a good relationship and they would call me and they would share this and I had to go to my manager and say, I, gotta sh I have to share this with you. This, you know, it's not a, a situation that can continue. And he did the right thing. He called the gentleman and um, he no longer was with the company, right? So that's about believing in yourself, being your true self. I'm like, this is not right. Whether I was male, female, green, blue, whatever, this is not appropriate corporate behavior. And I, I kind of removed the, the personal angst that I had from, and it was just professional. This is not good for our business to grow our business. Um, anyway, that's my therapy. You can find me later and give advice. Perfect. Can, I want to add one okay. thing that's yeah, important please. to me. I think these big things are important, but it's, I think it's the microaggressions that got to me. The little things that aren't really worth calling out, aren't really worth making a fuss about, those are the ones that I find I need to be very conscious about processing. The big things, the, the sexist things, the racist things, the works, it's okay. It's easy to, I mean, it's not okay, but it's easy to find someone to talk to about it. And but that the little is things, when you need the outlet, yeah. like you were talking about, yeah. exercise but or whatever things, it is. But the little things, that's harder to find someone who empathizes, and they get us down. Have you found ax throwing? <laughs> awesome idea. That's what I found recently for the microaggressions. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> a little bit close. So I kind of had a sort of similar line of questions, plural, I don't know. So when a workplace kind of wants you to be out, I guess, and, you know, promote diversity and stuff. How do you kind of, you know, do that knowing that you're very much not understood um, and that there's just, like, you, you know, the, the whole microaggression thing. People aren't, it feels like people aren't doing this because they just don't understand, but there's, of course, kind of, from my point of view, it seems like a lot of people just don't care when I feel like they really should. You know, how do you, I guess, in a corporate setting, advocate for, I wouldn't go so far as to say basic respect, but just like, how do you deal with people who don't know better and kind of nudge them in the right direction without, you know, because these things need to happen, but without coming across as a jerk. I think open, honest communication. It's all about communication, saying the right thing. And, uh, you know, I mean, you don't have to come directly to the point, right? I think extremely important to have that strong communication, not only for this topic, for anything, you know, with our, um, you know, customers, with our family. I think open, honest communication. Thank you. We have a very short amount of time, so hurry. 
Thank Hi, you. Uh, my name is Zaheen. I'm currently pursuing a PhD at University of Florida. So my question is, I come ac across as like rude whenever I try to make a presence of myself in a male-dominated area. So how in the industry do you not get like a pay cut or fired for a performance review that you're seen as rude because you've stood up for yourself or you've made a presence for yourself? How do you not have that fear? Or how do you not like, I guess, how do you just not get fired for that? Because it is, a, <laughs> it, because, because that's, that's really like what I'm afraid of because I do have the sort of presence to stand my ground, but I don't want to be come across come across as rude in a corporate setting? Uh, that's a hard, tough one, and I'm the one picking up the microphone because I, I suffer from that too, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you have to know organization dynamics, like yeah. how decisions are getting made. Like, you know, I can say politics here in the room because right. every company has, and family everywhere there is politics. But, but it's better word is organization dynamics. But understanding that and when to say, how to say, it's not just what you say, right? right? It is when to say, how to say, and who do you need to bring along with you when you're making a messaging across is very important, right? Mm -hmm. So say the thing you have to say, but maybe just like when you, if you're a software engineer, you're declaring a variable, you have to know the, you know, what condition it might give a code right. dump versus it is going to work, right? So knowing your circumstances and, you know, environment is important. Okay. But you will learn, you will learn over the years. I still make this. And I was going to say what you were saying before, really being true to yourself. If, if your personality is very forthright, yeah, it then is. <laughs> you, you do have to channel who you are, and you right. will find the right company that loves that, right? Okay. And so we also have to say sometimes you have to know when it's time to leave yeah. right. uh, an environment, and, and that's really hard to do. And, and we learn a lot from our mistakes. If we look at that as a mistake, it may not be as a mistake. It's just an opportunity to learn from um, maybe the path that wasn't right at the time. Right. I want to add to that. Your form of presenting as a woman is a form of diversity. You know, just wearing a skirt or whatever doesn't make us diverse. It's being different and you not being following the typical, you know, like I probably do, you know, want everyone to be happy stereotype. That's important and we need that in our world. So just keep doing it and it'll be fine. Thank you. We are out of time, but please, Vic. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Great panel, firstly. A quick question in the interest of time. Uh, over the years, of course, I'm a big fan and, and supporter of WIT, but many of my managers, if I'm not in the meeting, they would say that the other men in the room will just uh, ignore them if there's a comment, and somebody else in the round table will make almost exactly the same comment on, as if they never heard you as a, as a woman engineer or a woman scientist. And my daughter is facing a similar thing, and she's a senior scientist now, and so on. But in her new company, it's a small company, she feels that sometimes. But without being, how do you, because unless I was in the meeting over the years, you know, I would say, hey, guys, she is saying something or whatever. How do you manage that? It happens all the bloody time, just saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I will be nice. And I mean it. I think a lot of the time people don't even notice they're doing that, which is even worse than if they did it deliberately. So this isn't how to deal with it, but it's my trying to put a positive spin on uselessness. Tell us how to fix it. We yeah, are out. Of, we are over time, but hurry. Okay. Yeah, quickly. I, I think Thanks. sometimes you just have to but like pause and be like shameless about it and say that, hey, didn't I just say that? Yeah. Or did I not? <laughs> like sometimes you just have to call a spade a spade. Okay, one more, one more story. So um, if this is a meeting you go to regularly, right, and you know the personalities, you need to find an advocate in the room and have a strategy going in and raise the awareness that so-and-so just speaks over me, doesn't hear me. Could you, you know, be on my side? Because it's, it's, it's very tiring to always be our advocate up here exactly. and call it out because then we get labeled other words that That's aren't it. really nice for this panel. Um, but having somebody else in the room, that mentor, that ally, to be a partner and help manage the meeting um, is something that I've employed and know other people have employed successfully. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for all the questions. And thank you so much. Let's thank our panelists for taking the time and their contributions. And thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>